After my daily activities, I return home, tired but well. I feel happy and wish to make myself something to eat, and then get some rest. Home sweet home, here I am in front of my house. All that is left for me to do is put the key inside the lock and turn it. I put it inside the lock, but it will not turn. My impatience is growing by the second. Now I force the key a little, but carefully not to break it inside. And I do what all people do in these circumstances. I try turning it the other way round. The door was always opened by pushing it. Nonetheless, I also tried to pull it. I am overcome by a panic attack. Sometimes, when we are faced with situations that seem illogical to us, we will react illogically as well, as if the lack of external logic combined with internal logic could result in something rational or in the solving of such situation. I leave the key inside the lock because sooner or later I will have to open it. I am not picking keys at random to see if I get lucky. This key has opened the same door for years. One goes with the other and combined they will allow me to enter my house. I move away from the door, I look around, noticing every detail, unless I'm mistaken about the building, or the neighborhood, or the city. Maybe I am in a wrong world, and for my key to work, I must return to the world where things are always the same. The same keys will always open the same doors. Again, I notice the door of my house, the key in the lock. I say to myself, this has been the door of my house forever. And I am thinking, may it be that at some point this is not so anymore, and I rush towards the door in a new attempt to open it. They say that the third is the charmed one, and it must be true to some extent, as at the third try the key breaks in two. One part remains inside the lock, the other in my hand. Saddened and having lost my nerve a little, an awfully unpleasant situation, for it reveals my lack of control and my will to possess it, I give a strong kick on the door with my right foot. The delayed squeak of the rusty hinges, added to the dull sound of my foot kicking the door, the door hardly opens. As I look down to the threshold, I notice what has stopped it from opening totally. I can see dirt, grass, wheat, root pieces and plants, the beautiful and shiny marble flooring which gleamed at my house's entrance is no longer there. I look at the useless piece of key, leave it inside my pocket and launch myself towards the defenseless door as if it were the cause of all my troubles. Knowing it is no longer about locks and keys, I push it with all my strength, squashing a few weeds under my feet, squeezing out the chlorophyll from the green and lively plants, stirring the warm dirt. The door gives in a bit more, leaving me enough space to step inside.
I do so, and I see a butterfly flying out of my house. But now that I am inside again, I can say that my home, sweet home, is not there anymore. I can say that the butterfly came from a forest which seemed enchanted, and I strongly doubt it can adapt to the place where it flew. An annoying gust of wind carrying dust and leaves throws me out of balance. I close my irritated eyes and I hear, beside the wind, the sound of the door slamming shut behind me, followed by the faint roar of a beast. This cannot be. This is too much. I open my eyes, still irritated, and I see an astonishing lion coming towards me. It is walking and always in my direction. It is at about 20 meters away from me. I immediately turn my head in search for the door, but it is no longer there. It is all woods, a beautiful enchanted forest full of brown, golden, and green colors, a place where sun rays and the abundant vegetation seem to be dancing together. But the beast's roar and its slow advance towards me tell me that not all this is as beautiful as it may seem. In any case, not for me. The truth is, I don't know what to do. Running away from such a threat would be as ridiculous as having tried to open the door, turning the key in the opposite direction. It seems that today is my day of illogicality. I stand up and walk towards the lion, which it keeps on advancing towards me. He roars louder. It is already very close. It looks at me and quickens the pace. What will be of me? What of the butterfly, which is already on the other side? Is it safer than I am? I now come to understand that we alone make ourselves safe, as well as the way in which we confront every situation in life. But it is not just about the situation or places in which we find ourselves. He roars louder. It is already very close. It looks at me and quickens the pace. What will be of me? What of the butterfly? What of the butterfly, which is already on the other side? Is it safer than I am? I know, I now, come to understand that we alone make ourselves safe, as well as the way in which we comfort every situation in life. But it is not just about situations or places in which we find ourselves. But the creature is limping. I approach it fearlessly. There are hardly a few meters parting us. Once it notices I get closer friendly, it stops. Its rear right paw is bleeding and it is caught in a device which appears to be metallic. It roars again. Now my ears pick up the groan of pain. When we can't in interpret well a situation, we must wait until we have gathered all the facts. I wish I could help the suffering beast. I irresponsibly stroke its hairy head, 
this considering it could be the last time I see my hand or see at all but the beast lays down on one side and starts licking its wound. Gently and slowly, I sit down behind it, far enough from its head, thinking it is a huge animal weighing about 400 kilograms. I stroke the paw above the wound. I believe that in life, it is necessary we sometimes also show our emotions, apart from feeling them, to avoid embarrassing confusions. I raise the wounded paw with a bit of effort and I barely manage to move the device, which looks like a trap. The lion roars a deafening roar of pain and leans its enormous head to me. I can feel its breath all around me as it starts licking its wound and part of my hand holding its paw. It then peeps at me and goes on licking my hand and part of my arm. I focus on the device. It is like two metallic jaws with sharp teeth. Most of them beat in the animal's paw. The shawls are bound together by a big screw. I notice a small opening on one side. The animal is now sniffing me. It sniffs my perspired skin. I wish my scent will not stir its appetite. I detach myself for a moment from this delicate situation to look around. All is silent and peaceful. All is still. A beautiful forest which rather looks like a painting than nature and reality. Is everything in this di dimension attentive to what is happening? The beast is watching me and waiting. Without thinking twice, I make up my mind and reach for the strange device with both hands. I try to unclench it with all my strength, separate its metallic teeth from the animal's paw. The beast opens its jaws, showing the inside of its mouth, and it lets out a paralyzing roar. I decide to abandon my attempt at the mere sight of the size of its fangs. My eyes are fixed on the device. The predator has closed its mouth. I keep looking at the metallic jaws as I feel its large and rough tongue licking my hand. My eyes are fixed on the margin of the device, where the screw holds together the dented jaws. Again, I notice that small opening, a strange dent in the metal. The animal is looking at me. It is just looking and waiting. Without losing sight of the metallic knuckle, I reach in my pocket and pull out the piece of key I had left there from my house. Almost without thinking what I'm doing, I put it in the flint and turn around. The device gives in to the pressure. It disarms. I try to remove the metallic teeth from the lion's flesh, but its roar warns me not to proceed. I stop at once. I notice the ease and the dexterousness with which the animal frees itself from the device and it again starts to lick its wound, free again. It soothes the wound with care. 
It first licks its wounded paw, then my hand, my arm, and my face. And I think to myself, how much true communication is beyond words. I hear bird songs, a mixture of sounds from all animal species. A gentle breeze tells me that everything is all right. I look around again. I see a forest of salt with life. Nature has found its balance. I'm getting ready to leave, although, to be honest, I don't know where to. I find myself trapped in my own freedom. But this is too mundane, too earthy. I walk and walk. I can only walk for now. My feline friend is still limping. But it is by my side. It is accompanying me. And as I walk, I am thinking how life is. A situation that should be extremely perilous suddenly turns into one of maximum security and protection. Will we ever know with certainty what lies ahead of us after the moment we are living? Luckily, we will not. In an opening in the endless forest, my friend gets ahead of me, showing me an enormous and robust tree bigger than a house, and it starts toward it. Its diameter must easily exceed 10 meters. As I get closer, I can see a classical oval opening like those you usually find on trees of a certain size. The animal looks at me and I look at it. I rush towards that opening, which height exceeds mine. Again, we are exchanging glances, my mascot and me, when I see an insect flying out of the tree. It is the same butterfly and I enter the tree without a doubt. At last, I am back home. <laughs>